Um, I want to start by acknowledging uh, the, the um, original storytellers of our region, the Bachelor people, the traditional owners, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. And if you're ever looking for a book which um, really represents this region, um, check out The Legends of Mooney Jarl uh, from the Fraser Coast Library. Um, it was the very first children's book published by indigenous authors uh, and really tells the, the creation stories of this region. So The Legends of Mooney Jarl here at the, the libraries, published in 1964. Uh, this is, I think, the third year we've run Lines in the Sand, and it's just fantastic to see so many um, people come along to hear fantastic writers like we have today, so many people interested in books and storytelling um, and research and writing. And we have a, a fantastic presenter now, Kaylee Jeffrey, um, to talk to us about um, her book. And Under the Lino, um, there's a lot of um, family history is one of the really emerging areas uh, for that libraries are playing a strong role in people looking back, whether it's through Trove, whether it's through Ancestry.com, through rate, old rates notices and cemeteries. People can really discover their ancestors, discover different stories, whether it's convict, migrant, um, or other. And um, I think what, you know, what Kaylee's done in this book and what she's doing in communities around the state is really important for people who want to discover their, their you know, their ancestry and discover the stories because there's stories everywhere around Queensland that are yet to be told, um, like under the lino. So um, please make um, Kaylee welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, George. And thank you so much to the Fraser Coast Council and the Fraser Coast Libraries and the, the librarians who've been awesome at uh, making me feel so welcome here. And all of you, because I, I, I recognise so many of you who were in my session yesterday on journaling. So um, it, was, it was a wonderful day and uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. But the reason I'm here today is actually to tell you a story about uh, something that happened to me and my family about 23 years ago that culminated in something even bigger in the last couple of years. So uh, I've, I've got lots of lovely pictures up there on the board and I am actually known as the accidental historian in Queensland at the moment because I was never meant to be an historian. I hated history as a child. I used to fall asleep in my history classes and I think this, this whole project has been the universe paying me back for being disrespectful to my history teachers. <laughs> so they also call me that lino lady. So um, you'll see why, but I'm obsessed with old lino. So if anybody's got any, just let me know because I'm sure there's some floating around up uh, in Maribor and Harvey Bay Way. So what happened? I live in Brisbane and 23 years ago, my husband and I decided that we wanted to get off the rental roundabout and buy a house. We were 24 years old and we were only able to scrape together enough money to buy one of the worst houses in Brisbane. Now, I have, the day we went to have a look at this house in Milton, so I'll, I'll tell you where exactly it is in Milton uh, in a minute, was one of Brisbane's hottest days. It was in December and it was sweltering. We turned up at the front door and we could not find the real estate agent because he was hanging out at the corner underneath the eaves of that shop there that's, that's in the 74 floods actually, same street. He came running up the road and he said, I'm so sorry, he was all sweaty. I can't, I'm sorry I wasn't there to meet you but I just can't stay in that house on a day like today. <laughs> and we thought, oh my God. And I don't know if you can see what it says on the sign there but it's a bit of real estate uh, humour, ripe for renovation. That means something in this case. This house had tenants in it who didn't want to leave. So when we opened the front doors of the house, this wave of slimy, disgusting air rolled down the stairs, knocked us flat. And we thought, what is in there? Someone has died. But the tenants had made the house so disgusting that uh, we saw animal feces on the carpets. There were maggots on the kitchen floor. Rubbish was strewn everywhere. There was a drug den underneath the house that had needles scattered around. And I was a nurse at the time, so I was walking through the house with my hand over my mouth like this. My husband's an engineer, and he was walking around the house going, oh, my God, this is a 1912 Federation Queenslander. It's amazing. <laughs> so the last room we walk into, the real estate agent opens the door, 
and we walk in and there's a couple having sex. <laughs> and that was it for me. I went flying down the back stairs into the backyard, taking some big, big gulps of fresh air. And the agent comes up behind me and goes, so what do you think? <laughs> Oh, needless to say, I slapped him around a bit and said, look, dude, you've got to clean up the house. You've got to get rid of the tenants. You've got to put some coffee on to hide all the smells. And uh, my husband comes up behind me and kicks me, says, shut up. You just put 20 grand onto the cost of the house. But we did buy it. We did buy this, this decrepit old Queenslander. And it's on the same block as the Forex Brewery. So I just want to give you some, everybody knows where that is, okay? So Milton is one of the oldest suburbs in, in settled Brisbane from the, the, the white man's days. So um, there's a lot of history here. So we back onto the grounds of, of um, the old Bishop's Bourne and the Milton Brewery. So that gives you a bit of an idea. So the house was divided into two flats. And uh, as I said, it was in a shocking state. Um, and, but you can see there's some bones of an old Queenslander there. This picture I love because of the toilet. It's brand new. I said to David, why did they put a new toilet in just for the open for inspection? He said, you're a goose. He said, I put that toilet in because you wouldn't use the one that they'd left in there. <laughs> and we were, we were, you know, big plans on renovating this house. But as he said, I wouldn't move into the house until we'd cleaned it out. So we went pretty gung-ho. We, we had a skip underneath that pile there and we, <laughs> we did find it eventually. Um, but we were ripping things out. Fibro, had no idea about fibro. So we were breathing in asbestos all over the place. But we chucked everything out. And um, keep an eye on that old kitchen recess, kitchen stove recess there because that becomes very important. But my mum at this point says, will you slow down, kids, because you're going to miss something. They have old stuff hidden in those old houses and you're going to miss it. We were like, oh, what sort of old stuff do they have? And these are the sorts of things that people find in their houses. Put your hand up if anybody's found anything in their houses. Look, we've got something. Oh, look, 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 this is great. So usually people find old newspapers. That's the main thing. And when you're supposed to be pulling up nails and painting walls, but you're actually sitting down on the ground reading old newspapers, it becomes a bit of a problem. But we found all sorts of things, bottles and stuff like that in our house. Some people find love letters and lots of people find money because these old houses are covered in layers and layers of lino. And it's nearly like people didn't want to clean the damn stuff anymore, so they just put another layer on top. And you'll recognise some of the patterns there. I've got some outside for later to show you as well. Um, and this is me cleaning up the, the vestiges of the lino that, that was in the house and the lovely pink walls of lead paint that I breathed in over the years. Um, so back in that kitchen stove recess, when we took down, there was a wall there, um, walling it off. We took up the last bits of lino in that room and this is what we found. Four five-pound notes and three Commonwealth Bank passbooks dating from the 1940s to the late 1950s and the amount of money inside these open accounts added up to more than £2,000. Now, £20 back in the day was a month's wages for a working class family and £2,000 was enough to buy you four brand new houses. So for, for a working class Milton, this was a living fortune to find um, from so long ago. There are some coins and such there. Now, remember this was 1996. What didn't we have in 1996? Internet, okay, it was new. We didn't really, we certainly didn't have social media. So David and I didn't really know what to do with all this old stuff. What we should have done was talk to our neighbors who were in their eighties and they would have had all the stories to tell us. But we didn't because we were young and naive and completely self-obsessed and uh, into renovating the house. So as you are at that age. I put it away in, a bank, in, in an envelope for 21 years and I found it again in 2017. Of course, I'm 21 years older at this point, much more interested in family history. I'd become a writer, loved my community and I had a connection to social media. So I decided to put a picture up on Facebook, on a, a Facebook page called Old Brisbane Album. There's an old Queensland album too, for those of you who are interested. Uh, and I said, what should I do with all this old stuff that I found underneath my lino? 
And what happened next absolutely blew my life apart. Over 1,000 people responded to my question over two days. So I had my phone pinging constantly with people throwing questions at me. There, we, we had to start our own Facebook group called Under the Lino to cope with the huge influx of, of questions and information. And basically, people wanted to get involved in something like a mystery. It was, it was really fun. And so these were the sorts of questions they were throwing at me, the ones that you're thinking about now. Who were the people who used to live in your house? What are the names on the bank books? How come they had so much money? Why were they hiding it underneath the lino? What was that money worth back then and what's it worth today? Are there any heirs? Is there anybody that we can get the money to? These are the sorts of questions that, um, that they were asking. And then they went, for every question they asked, another 10 questions came. So I became like this crazy, crazy project puppet. I, they call me a project manager, which is a misnomer because basically the community was telling me what to do. We turned it into a, an investigation. So uh, just picture the world's biggest detective agency, and that was us. Literally hundreds and hundreds of people uh, digging into the past. Because I didn't know anything about how to do family history research, the, the, the community took over and I was the girl on the ground and they would find all of this stuff through Trove and church records and school records and they, um, they would send me off and say, right, we found gravestones, go, go have a look in Tuong Cemetery uh, or we found people uh, in the archives, go and look up these records in the archives. So I'd take my two kids and off we'd go grave hunting and it was huge fun. We really got to know Brisbane, got to know how to, how to do research and, um, yeah, and the kids learned how to deal with the elders in the community. They learned how to speak to their seniors, which was wonderful. So um, they, when, I, when they found people to talk to, I would have to go and interview them. And basically, the people in the team, I call them the under the lino team members, were made up of people like you, people in the community who were really interested in history, in life, in everything that was going on in the local suburbs, anything to do with where they'd grown up. So I had teachers, librarians, archivists, historians, um, everybody joined on, on this particular um, journey. So the first place to start is obviously the bank books. I mean, we're, we're detectives now, so we have to look at the clues that we have. The, the bank books held an extraordinary amount of information. Uh, and we found out that Arthur and Eleanor Webster were the owners of our house from 1913 when it was first built. And they lived in the house for, for many years and they had two accounts. Arthur and Eleanor had their own account, uh, had a, a joint account and Eleanor had her own account. Who thinks that was very usual? Why did women not have their own accounts? Yeah, because they didn't earn any money. When they got married, they had to give up their jobs. Mm -hmm. Sort it out? <laughs> I don't know that the answer to that question, but um, there we go. Yes, so it was very really difficult times for women. And yes... They don't freeze your account. They just change it to your name automatically. There you go. You see? Yeah. <laughs> and that's a perfect example of what would happen in our group. So someone would ask that question. I would just be quiet <laughs> because I never knew the answers. And someone would jump in and answer the question. So all the people who got involved in this particular side were the bankers who were in the group, the retired bankers, retired accountants, anyone who had an interest in the money side of things. And um, where do you think they sent me first? The bank, the Commonwealth Bank. And who thinks they were helpful? <laughs> they were going through a royal commission at the time <laughs> and they had me rocking up on their doorstep saying, oh, I reckon you've got about $250,000 in an account that I'm going to tap into. They were not helpful. They didn't care because they were, you know, too busy. They were too young, the people I spoke to, 
Uh, the elders in the banking community were interested, but um, they didn't help me at all. Um, but lots of people in the team were banking people and they were really great at deciphering what was going on in the bank books. So while they were off, you're looking at who, uh, how many transactions there were and who did the transactions, the rest of us who were actually a little bit nosy wanted to know about the people. So we, we looked at who the people in the community were around this particular subject. Arthur Webster, fantastic guy. He was born in 1890 and he started working for Queensland Rail when he was 16. The records at Queensland Rail are extraordinary and we all know that Queensland Rail went all over the state and were one of the biggest employers um, during the First and the Second World War. And what we found out about Arthur was that he was a notorious bully. And what we know about history is that it's the bullies who are remembered. It's the notorious ones who stick in people's memories. So I was interviewing elders at Queensland Rail who are in their 80s and 90s who still remembered Arthur Webster. <clears throat> And they would tell me some terrible stories about this man. And so we built up this picture of a man who was a bully at work. And so what do you think we were thinking? At? He was a bully at home. But was he? We don't know. We don't know. They're, they're, we have to leave, leave, uh, leave something to the imagination. Because, of course, Eleanor. Eleanor was born a Murphy. And uh, she was from the Ipswich Murphy family, and later I'll tell you the um, Maryborough Murphy family, one of them. She was six years older than Arthur, which might explain why she had her own bank account. And she died six weeks after the last transaction in the bank books. So what does that tell you? She was the one who did the banking because I was the next person to find them. Okay, so there is absolutely nothing in history about this woman. Nothing, no footprint, no photographs, no nothing. I couldn't believe that there's nothing because she was just a housewife. I was just a housewife when this happened. Oh my God, I would hate it if there would be nothing left in history about me and my family. So it became my job to give Eleanor a voice. And when I really found out who this woman was, it was when I looked at the gravestones at the Tuong Cemetery and found this. Arthur and Eleanor had had two sons and one of them died at the end of the First World War. Ten months of age, he had gastritis, which is something that we can sort out now. At the time, lots of issues. Things were scarce. Um, Arthur was working for the railways, so he was probably not home. And imagine the trauma at the end of the First World War to lose a baby. So this was a bereaved family. And those of you who did my journaling class yesterday knows what, what work I do with bereaved parents and knows that bereaved parents suffer extraordinarily and they can change their personality. So we don't think Arthur was necessarily domestically violent at home, but we think he was traumatised by whatever happened with the family. So there was another son though, Morgan, four years old uh, when his brother died, but lots of records about him. We got super excited because of course we've got now an heir who's hopefully had grandchildren. Yay, we found someone to give the money to. Except he married a local lady. He went to the, the schools locally. We found out lots about him. Um, and then we, we found out that the marriage was annulled. Do you know how we found that out? In the Truth newspaper. <laughs> what is the Truth newspaper doing in their house? The Truth newspaper reported that because, um, because he was unable to consummate the marriage, it was annulled. They mentioned in the paper that Morgan Webster was impotent. I'm telling you, nobody in social media talks about that kind of stuff today. <laughs> but back then, this was the case. And the railway elders I interviewed still remember that Arthur Webster's son couldn't get it up. They used to tease him at work. This is the sort of social stuff that was going on. No wonder he beat his co-workers. You know, this is the kind of stuff. So after their marriage dissolved, he moved back in with mum and dad and lived in the house until 1989 as a bachelor. Never had any kids. So there's nobody to give the money to. That's it. We couldn't find anybody. But that's okay. We went sideways. We 
started a family tree on Ancestry.com. Uh, one of the girls in the group ran this tree and we found more than 250 family relatives um, that, that belonged to this wonderful family uh, dating back to the early 1800s. Fantastic experience. And of course, I became a media tart when all over the radios, uh, I was on um, the telly, I was in the paper, looking for people who might know something about this story. And we found people everywhere. The wonderful web that is Queensland, where he, um, everybody knew somebody who was involved in this story somehow. And so I, I found people who lived in the house. I found relatives. I found um, beneficiaries of Morgan's will. It was, it was a wonderful experience. And I've, we've become close with all of these people, my family and theirs. And there's the Mariborough connection. So the Murphy family, uh, Eleanor's grandfather, maternal grandfather, Michael Murphy, um, were, lived in Ipswich and moved to Mariborough. And we, he died in Mariborough. And I went on a big hunt and found uh, Michael Murphy's uh, gravestone in the Mariborough Cemetery, which was fantastic fun. Um, and also proves how difficult family history is. Look at the spelling of the name. Oh my God, you try and find Murphy's with all the different spellings and, and work out who everybody is. But, but that brought us to Mariborough. So this story suddenly started getting bigger, much bigger, Ipswich and Mariborough. And then somebody sent me the only photograph of the Webster family that's ever been, <clears throat> and that exists today. And that is Arthur Webster as a young boy with his family which was beautiful. It showed us lots of things about who these people were. I could tell that the family was probably quite wealthy. There was a lot, um, lot going on in this family psychologically um, and you can tell a lot from a photograph. So we were, we were very fortunate to find that. And then we discovered that who remembers Webster's biscuits, right? Arthur Webster was the nephew of David and Clara Webster who were the bakers in Brisbane who started Webster's Biscuits and the Shingle Inn. So the, suddenly iconic Brisbane, you know, exploded and people started t sharing stories about their relationship with the Shingle Inn and um, how they used to be a baker for Webster's Biscuits and they were thrilled to be involved in the project and someone even gave me a Webster's Biscuit box for a gift, which was pretty special because they're rare as hen's teeth. Um, and lots of photographs went round about the Webster's. Now, I haven't told you about the third bank book. I told you there were three bank books. There was, this is the mystery. It was pretty easy relatively to find out about the Websters, but there were three bank books in the house. And this one belonged to a woman called Mrs. Muriel White. We have never found Mrs. Muriel White. The address in the back of the bank book was Bristol Street West End, not my street name at all. What was a Bristol Street West End book doing in my house? So it became a real bugbear for all of us to find out who this person was. There was a thousand pounds in this account and we think Eleanor was hiding somebody else's um, bank book. And then we found out that there was a Muriel Murphy living in Bristol Street West End. And who remembers Eleanor's maiden name? Murphy. People started buying birth, death and marriage certificates out of their own money, out of their own pockets to find out if there was a relationship. And we found out that Eleanor and Muriel were first cousins. But she never became Mrs. Muriel White. She became Mrs. Muriel Hill. Who on earth is Mrs. Muriel White? So there were all sorts of uh, theories going on about who this woman was. Has anybody got any, any ideas? She was a madam. Okay, you think there was some brothel action going on? My house was divided into two flats. That's a very plausible theory. When we were looking at why they had so much money and where it was coming from on a railway worker's wage, brothels came into the picture. And one of the women in the group said, there were heaps of brothels around your area, Orkinflower, Petrie Terrace, Milton. Um, it's highly plausible. And she said one weekend she was reading the newspaper and she came across an article that had a picture of her family home in Petrie Terrace on it. And they'd, uh, the new owners had done it up and they'd done the house history. And they discovered that um, the house used to be run as a brothel. She's reading the article going, well, that's not right. That's when I was living in the house. That's not possible. So she called the paper who sent her to the house and the new owners showed her all of the documents they had, said, yes, your great-great-grandfather built this house, Cheryl. 
He was a local politician. And he was a local brothel keeper. And when he died, your grandmother took over. And you were born into the house while it was being run as a brothel. And um, they showed her the red stained glass window that they used to put a candle behind to show the boys at the barracks that business was open. So she, her family still doesn't believe her. But it wasn't run as a brothel, my house. So we, we investigated that. I'd have loved that. That would have been awesome. So we've got all this information. We don't know whose bank account that was. We believe that the Websters were hiding money in a third account. They were pensioners and there was £500 in Arthur and Eleanor's other accounts. Why do you think they kept them capped at £500? They'd lose their pension if they had more than £500. So what were they going to do with their excess cash? They couldn't spare. They were tight. They put it in a dodgy account. That's what we think happened. So, but why was she hiding it? Why was she hiding it under the lino? Nobody has the answer. So we had to look at history. We had to dig right back in time and work out what was going on. You've got to remember, before our time, but our parents' times and our grandparents' times, two world wars they lived through. As Kerry O'Brien said yesterday in his talk, um, they drew a line north of Brisbane to say that the Japanese could have North Queensland. And I met someone recently who actually had Japanese printed shillings ready for them to move into Queensland. So people were scared. They were scared of losing their money. People hid money. Does anyone in the room hide money? Still hide money. <laughs> yeah, no one's, people are going. <laughs> so people hide money for lots of different reasons. Uh, women were dependent on men. So, you know, Eleanor's not earning any money. It's horrible to not bring cash in. Um, very easy to start bank accounts. There were three different bank, bank account, uh, the branches. Why do you think they had different branches? So no one would know. Yeah, so, hello, Mrs. Webster. How are you today? You come to do your banking? Why have you got Mrs. Muriel White's account? That's a bit weird. So she opened it at somebody else's branch. So we've got cost of living. We looked at everything. We looked at the pension rules. We looked at how much money people were earning, how much they were spending. We were trying to work out were they brothel keepers, were they horse racing um, uh, betters, were they bookies, were they trading in war bonds. There was hundreds of, hundreds of things we looked into. We looked into life as a, a railway man, life as a housewife did lots of exploration and into the times to come up with some of the theories that we came up with. And then someone sent me this map. Okay, so we were looking in the time sort of 1900 forward. We're actually looking back in time now. Someone sent me the map of, <laughs> um, what's the point of thing here? So these, uh, this is Roma Street Station. This is Milton train line and Milton Road here and Lang Park or Suncorp Stadium. This is the very first land sales in Brisbane after Queensland and New South Wales separated. And this is uh, just my Milton Orkin flower area. And this was fascinating because this opened up history way back uh, to the 1800s. And all of these people who owned that land were politicians. All right. Okay, so, um, and has anyone read The Main Inheritance? Patrick Main, he was a local politician and he owned all the land opposite Suncorp Stadium. Now, this block here is where my house is, all right? Lots of very famous people around here. But it was owned by a fellow called George Leslie. Who has heard of the Leslie brothers? Couple. So the Leslie brothers were responsible for opening up the Darling Downs for white settlement after Cunningham found the gap, okay? And uh, Patrick Leslie, George's brother, built Newstead House in Brisbane. So all of a sudden these wonderful stories started pouring in about local history, um, iconic places in Brisbane uh, that dated back a long way. And um, so when um, we found the next thing, that took us to an even more special place. George Leslie was friends with Ludwig Leichhardt. And he, uh, there was a letter that I found at the State Library of New South Wales that said, my dear sir, thank you so much for giving me those four bullocks that I took on my last journey 
and that was his penultimate journey. He went missing after that. And so my son comes home from school the same day I found that letter and says, oh, I've got to do an assignment on an Australian explorer. Do you know anything about Ludwig Leichhardt? <laughs> Next thing I'm standing in front of 120 Year 5 students telling them that Ludwig Leichhardt was on my land. He had his bullocks out the back. And, uh, yeah, he was friends with the guy who used to own our property. And one kid puts his hand up and goes, oh, yeah? Well, my great-great-grandfather was the fifth Premier of Queensland. And he lived in Government House just around the corner from you. And, oh, that's pretty good, kid. And I said, well, did you know that my street, Cusler Terrace, was named after the guy who built Government House? <laughs> so... We had a duel. We had an historical duel, me and a, and a 10-year-old kid. And the class was like watching tennis. But, so, you know, it was pretty spectacular uh, to find this sort of stuff out. So this is a picture of my house and it backs onto the... So Forex Brewery is over here, okay? This land here belongs to... After George Leslie died, his widow gave it to the church and they built the Bishop's Bourne of Brisbane there now the old Bishop's Bourne of Brisbane. And I still have all this beautiful bushland behind my house because it's owned by the church. But I want to show you this picture because, you know, I give a lot of a hard time to these new development, new, new um, real estate developments that, that pop up. And I say, oh, my God, you wouldn't want to come home drunk because you wouldn't know which house was yours. They look the same. Get a load of the Queenslanders. And because they were flat packed, you could buy Queenslanders flat packed. And I love this picture because, you know, nothing's changed. Um, we, we do revere the Queenslander, but, uh, but I love that find, finding that picture because I just imagine Arthur and Eleanor moving into their brand new house with a white picket fence um, around about the same time. So the community threw so many stories at us. There were hundreds of stories and they were all related in some way whether they were family members, whether they had found missing things. We started looking for other people's missing, missing property and, and relatives. We were able to link people together. We, were, um, we did some really wonderful things in the journey that we went through and we introduced lots of people to each other. Found out we had the brothel stories, found out all about um, local like murders. We have some great murder stories, but you're going to have to buy the book because I'm not going to tell you what they are. Um, but they were all related back to our house in some way um, and, and really spooky, uh, creepy ways. Who remembers Hugh Lunn? Yeah, so Hugh Lunn got involved in the story because he wrote a book called Fred and Olive's Blessed Lino. And someone said, oh, Lino, you should meet Hugh Lunn. So I met him and, yes, he shared his Lino stories with me and that just made me more interested in Lino. Um, and so, yeah, we found out loads of stuff and we've shared all of those stories online. So the team is made up of these sorts of people, people who would knock on my door at any time of day to, um, to have a look at the bank books, to talk about it, to, to discuss it, to have little round table conferences. They'd bring food. So I would put the kettle on and off we'd go. <clears throat> and then we would start going on little tours, Boggo Road Jail and all sorts of places that we found related to this story. <clears throat> places I hang out now. Oh, my God. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Jails, Bogo Road Jail, trains, obsessed with trains, crazy train addict now, archives. This is Lynn and I, she's one of the members of the group. This is us finding Michael Murphy's grave at the Maryborough Cemetery. We were pretty excited about that. And that's Brennan and Garrity's store in Maryborough that we absolutely love because they have praise and praise and praise of lino. You go there and you ask them to see their old lino, it's absolutely fantastic. Things I do now. I do talks like this. I get invited to, to conferences like this and I get to meet people like you guys. I speak to children in school. I speak to elders in the community. I teach people about family history. I have ice cream with famous authors in the streets of Harvey Bay last night. I meet, I meet local mayors and, and councillors that I have no idea who they are. And they ask to be in photographs and I'm in the photograph with them and, and then I find out later that they're really well-known local personalities. And, uh, and then last year I did a TEDx talk on the, the benefits of this project for the community, which is about to go live um, and hopefully um, 
make a big difference in the community uh, already. So it's been pretty special. The, the, my local council has been amazing with this project. They, they paid for the website where we share all the stories and we share resources and media, everything that's had to do with this project to help people with their own family history stories. Um, and that's my local councillor and the Lord Mayor of Brisbane has been really amazing. The book, okay, book. I never wanted to write a book about this project uh, because I didn't have time. The community asked me to write the book. They said, Kayla, you're an author, you're a writer. You have to get this story down, it's too much. I said, I don't have time and I don't have money. I'm, I'm not gonna self-publish it, but I'm not gonna wait for a publisher to find it. So we're at a bit of a standstill. And they said, no, that's not good enough. We think you're the right one to write this story. So they crowdfunded it. They raised $17,000 for me to do the first print run of this book. And what does that mean? I've got 350 bosses in the community who when they saw me down at the shops would say, what are you doing here? It's supposed to be writing the book because I pre-ordered a copy. I hadn't put one word down. I had all this money in my bank account. I was terrified. So I, you want to talk about Charlotte Nash's uh, yesterday did a, a how to be motivated to write your story. That's motivation when you've, you've got all those bosses. And um, so I wrote it in nine months and the community edited it. They designed the cover of the book. They did everything. Uh, that, that book there. And um, then they did it all for free and they did it out of the goodness of their hearts. The first print run didn't make any money. It went out there to the community. Everybody got their copy. They loved it. And um, the community then said I could print as many copies of as, as I liked and make that my income, which is wonderful. So uh, it's here today. I'll be signing later on today. Um, and the latest news that... Uh, that um, it, it's looking, people are looking to turn it into a screen adaptation. That might take 10 years, so don't hold your breath. Um, but, uh, but it's certainly been a high interest to people in, in Queensland. And I won the, the John Oxley Community Library Award a couple of months ago for, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, that was a, a real treat. And I shared the award, not the money, but the accolade. <laughs> I shared it with the community because I couldn't have done it without them. I mean, this is an amazing community project. Just wanted to show you a couple of pictures. To, to basically, I was sent this picture from people who lived in the house after Eleanor died. Arthur and Morgan split the house into flats and rented out the front to 10 pound poms. A 10 pound pom sent me this picture and that's nearly the identical picture of the day my daughter came home from hospital which is kind of cool really to see the, see the difference. And that is David and I as children and that is my children now standing in front of the house that we've renovated. So that's just to show you that nothing really changes. <laughs> um, so just to, just to, you realise that none of this is about the money or the bank books, right? This is all about community. The, the joy and the the beauty of the stories and the sharing and the connectivity and the, the wonderful things that came out of this is all what happened. That, that is everything that this project um, has given to people. And what it did is provided safety online. I know we talk about how scary it is online sometimes, but this was a safe private group where people were safe to express their opinions, their ideas, share their stories. Uh, and we welcomed them. And so people who were ashamed to tell their families that they used to work in a factory now had a place that they could share them without any, um, anyone putting them down. So we connected generations. We had children talking to their grandparents. We had people with social anxiety who wouldn't come to an event like this, but they were completely themselves online and nobody was giving them any grief about it. So it was a beautiful space for people to connect. My job now is to teach people like yourselves that time is of the essence. And if you're thinking about asking people in your family about your family history, do it today, after you've seen Kerry O'Brien, of course, but don't wait because a couple of people I interviewed have passed away since I've interviewed them and they had some wonderful stories to tell. Um, make a book about your life, but don't publish it, just write it. Get the words down on paper. 
type up some documents right on the back of old photographs in pencil so it doesn't come through. But really leave a footprint. Don't be Eleanor Webster. Don't have us in 10 years time when we grow up and we stop being so self-obsessed wanting to ask you questions in 30 or 40 years time when you're not here anymore. Leave something behind for us because the kids today are self-obsessed but, um, but they won't be when they get older. Um, and don't be shy of your past. Be proud of it because you're amazing people with wonderful stories to tell and it's always a pleasure to hear them. So thank you very much for having me today.